Good morning. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here at Autostar Innovate 2014. I appreciate uh, all of you who have sat and listened to me uh, speak about compliance for the past several days. I know it's probably not as uh, financially productive as speaking about selling cars and uh, and, and, and getting ancillary products into, the, into those sales and some of the other things that y'all do. But I can tell you that compliance is my life and, it, and a little preventative compliance will take you a long way. The title of our panel today is The Business Bible. In keeping with our title, I'd like to begin the presentation with a quote from Proverbs uh, 10, verse 4. Poor is he who works with negligent hands, but the hand of the diligent man makes rich. So today we are gonna, going to discuss operational, technological, financial, and legal issues dealers are facing. A negligent dealer does not think or care about these issues. A diligent dealer makes constant efforts to expand his or her knowledge to seek out cutting edge technology and to grow the business despite challenges the dealer may face. The diligent dealer is innovative and committed to a success. <clears throat> Our panelists today aim to help you become the diligent dealer, to confront the challenges you, fa you face and grow your wealth. To my left, uh, is Alan Dobbins, and I'm just going to go over, not, not that Alan needs any introduction. He's the president and CEO of Autostar. He brings state-of-the-art technology and a compliance-focused platform on which you can build your company's point-of-sale and servicing system. All the way at the end is Russ Asbury. Russ serves as the CFO of Autostar. Russ comes from the front lines of auto sales and finance where he was CFO at U.S. Auto Sales. He joined Autostar last March and wants to share his strategies for financial success with you. Steve Levine is right next to, uh, to Alan. Steve is, the, is Autostar's chief legal officer, ensuring Autostar operates within the confines of the law. Steve's focus on compliance means that you can sleep better at night. Susan Permutter. Susan is the Chief Revenue Officer at Sigma Payment Processing. She focuses on developing integrated payment solutions on business software and in an electronic environment. These leaders that we have today are sharing their knowledge with you, and hopefully you can go home a diligent dealer. So let's get this panel started. <coughs> the first question I have is, what do, and this, and this is for the whole panel, what do you see as some of the operational challenges dealers face in today's environment of increased regulatory scrutiny by the federal and state regulators and pressure from the capital markets? I'm going to let you start. There's no particular order, so whoever wants to start. I'll, I'll take it first. Okay. <coughs> Y'all tired of me talking about the uh, CFPB yet? I'll talk about yeah. it some more. <coughs> Here's what I see happening in, in your space. You know, you don't have to worry about the CFPB coming through your back door because they're already in through your back door. They're putting a lot of pressure on your banks, your capital providers, floor plan lines. They are pushing down to them what they expect to see. They're pushing to the credit reporting agencies the standards that they expect to see. So they're already in your lives. And if you haven't been subject to an audit from your capital provider yet, you're going to be. Because from, from what I'm hearing from dealers that I've spoken to, they're getting more vigilant. They're spending more time in the shop. They're asking harder questions. They want to see policies. They want to see procedures. The end result is you're going to have to spend more money, more time, more of your resources investing in all that. And at the same time, there's a lot of pressure about add-on products, that there's other ways the CFPB looking uh, things that they're looking at that I think are going to uh, inhibit your ability to make, uh, make money. So I think you're being you know, squeezed from both ends. I, I think that's something that you're really going to have to look at and, and weigh in the next year. 
Okay. I'll go next. Go ahead, Susan. Um, my, from my perspective, one of the operational challenges that you guys facing are today is how to keep and control your labor costs while your loan portfolio grows. Um, being able to touch the number of accounts necessary to provide equitable collections for your portfolio uh, is costly. And by implementing new payment technology that will keep your payment costs low, by allowing your customers to self-serve their loans using a consumer payment portal, or providing them a toll-free number where they can call in and self-serve their payment, will help you keep your labor costs static while your portfolio grows. So rather than investing in people and training, use that money to invest in very static costs that will allow your collectors to negotiate payments with those consumers that need negotiation and those consumers who want to pay on their own to pay on their own. So if you haven't started weighing these options today in your business and your portfolio is growing day by day, it would be my advice that you take, take a little time and weigh these costs against hiring new personnel. Um, <clears throat> I'll go next. So, uh, <clears throat> sorry, I about lost, lost my voice. Um, and from my perspective, one of the things that I was, uh, when I was talking to Rick uh, yesterday, I, I was kind of getting to the point with him and he's, um, with regard, I was trying to get to the point with, that we discussed that you needed to focus on reviewing what the software is actually producing, the results that the software is producing. You know, you can't necessarily assume anything, so don't. And the reason I say that is because I can tell you on, in many instances where people have gone in and they've done something as simple as, oh, we're going to go sell this product. And they add this new fee that they decide to enter without regard to where it prints on the contract or anything like that. So it's, it's a never-ending thing. If you're going to change something in your business and you're going to change the way you work with a different provider or do anything like that, you need to review the software and actually look at it from the perspective of, okay, how is this going to impact me uh, well, short term and long term? I can also tell you that, that um, I have seen many instances where you know, things, people make decisions on your behalf that you're not necessarily aware of. And I, and I would not, don't ever look to any provider that you do business with to make all your legal decisions for you. you know, I was at a, a conference recently and one of the panelists that was up there said, we make all the decisions basically regarding things like adverse action. <clears throat> and they do that automatically through some sort of, I don't know, artificial intelligence. Re the reality of the situation is uh, you are the only one that knows, uh, you know, presumably why these, why these loans or, or why these contracts were declined. Um, so don't, don't just depend on your software to make every single decision and think you're home free. Ultimately, it's your name on the contract. It's your name on every form that you send out. So protect it that way. You're protecting millions of dollars. And, you know, some, some people I talk to will say, okay, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> this extra cost or this is too expensive or that. And then I'll say, okay, well, what's your portfolio? You have like $10 million in, in a portfolio, for an instance, or $5 million. <clears throat> would, you, would you spend $200 to protect $5 million? Would you spend 1000 to protect $5 million? What is your number? What is the number? You buy insurance for a reason. You buy insurance because you're, you know, you're cautious. You don't want to have a problem later and then you didn't plan for so don't take anything for granted. Just, just have a constant review process. And unfortunately, in our world today, it's expensive. It just is there, and there's nothing we can really do about it. We have to live within this, within this uh, world. I think that um, one of the best <coughs> things you can do is attending these conferences to keep you up to date on what compliance issues are coming at you. Um, and then... Uh, taking that information and actually using it when you get back to uh, implement some ideas that'll help keep you compliant. So <coughs> I think being here is a great first step to learning what's going on. And I think we've done a pretty good job on trying to let you know what's coming and you know, how to hopefully deal with some of that. So uh, what I'm hearing from the panel is that uh, compliance issues are very, very important. Uh, you can gain some efficiency through technological innovation and working in an electronic environment, maybe reduce some of your labor costs by uh, in involving an electronic payments provider. Uh, you should be in constant communication with your vendors 
about the programs that you're offering and um, take control of the decisions. Don't rely on those vendors to, to tell you uh, what, what you're doing in the business, but take control of your decisions and you can rely on the vendors and do due diligence on the vendors, but they are really, this is your business and, and you should be involved in the decisions. And then uh, the, the last thing was uh, keep up, oh, always continue to gain knowledge. And, and continue to go to these types of conferences and involve your peers in, in, in 20 groups and other, other types of, of situations so that you are constantly learning. The, the, did I miss anything? No. Okay. Great. The, the, next, the next question that, that we, I'd like to ask the panel is, uh, what services are important for technology providers to offer to their clients? Say it again now. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you said something else. What, what services are, are, are important for a technology provider to offer to their customers, their clients, and, 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 and for consumers? Oh, okay. Well, in, in our particular case, I'll tell you one of our future, or one of the things that we're focusing on for the future is, frank, is automation. So <clears throat> you'll see that as our products uh, continue to evolve, we have, a, we have a major focus on automation. You've probably seen some of that with Insight. Uh, and, the, and the fact that you know, those reports can all be scheduled and, and automated to run at particular points in time. You can run them multiple times a day. But let's fast forward and let's take that one step further. Let's fast forward to when the F2 product's released. So F2 has been constructed with uh, something called automation steps. And essentially what that is is workflow. So you know, if this event happens over here, then that, that, that can happen. The reason that's important is because, you know, frankly, is your budgets are stretched. And, uh, and the reliability of information is, you know, so important. You want to make sure that, that various things get updated in the correct way. So your process, like Pokey's process, may be a little different than Joe's process, okay? So his process for doing something means he has to do this, this, and this. It could be a state-specific thing, or it just may be a Pokey-specific thing. So the reality is, is that, you know, the goal for us is to try to continue to push automation through the software so that the decisioning happens automatically, so that human beings aren't having to go, oh, I gotta update this and this, and then that doesn't get updated over here because somebody forgot. So that's gonna be our focus for the future, and I think that's gonna be, um, that's gonna be really beneficial to you guys in the long term. And I think that also helps with, uh, the automation helps with removing some of the discretion from your everyday transactions and removing some of that discretion from everyday transactions certainly helps uh, from a uh, potential violation of the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. So it's very important to have automated systems and remove the do we, don't we button. You, you, you jumped to my line. Oh, sorry. My, my line is automation equals standardization, and, and standardization is really important. Alan and I went to the uh, Texas Consumer Credit Commissioner a couple of months ago to show them secure clothes. And you know, we were curious about what kind of response we were going to get. Well, they loved it. And, and one of the remarks that they made to us was, was this is going to make their job easier uh, for audits and everything because it's standardization. Uh, the thing that, that regulators are looking for, you know, heck, one of the things that the CFPB is talking about is they want to see standardization. They, they want to make sure that, that in the dealership things are getting done the same way every time and, and it's the right way. And, and I think the more that you could automate, the more that you could remove, you know, the one-off uh, process that you have, uh, the better off you're going to be. And, you know, I, I invite all of you, when you go back to your dealerships, look around with a fresh set of eyes and, and look for those processes where it's, you know, somebody <coughs> in the back room doing something by themselves and, and look for opportunities to, you know, turn it into a complete process within the structure of your dealership. And I think you can be a lot healthier. And one more thing I want to say about that. When we went to the uh, Consumer Credit Commissioner's one office. Thing? Yeah. Come on, more than one. One, one, the, one of the funny things they said was, they were sitting there watching this and they said, dealers really want to tell these people all this information? <laughs> they were like surprised that you guys might actually want to disclose everything. It was shocking to them. They would loved it. Yeah, yeah it, it was an enlightening conversation. Because they had the mind frame uh, really different. And, and, you know, we went through uh, the arbitration uh, provisions with them, and, and they were just really impressed. 
uh, that people want this and, and, and want to disclose it. And they're like, gosh, if, if everybody was doing that, uh, I, I don't think arbitration would be under fire the way it is. I mean, it's, it's really an interesting conversation. It's true. Susan, do you have anything to say about uh, the technology? Just because? I would say that, you know, in your businesses, consumers drive what payment engines um, that you should be considering taking. Um, with the push to serve the unbanked community, there are all kinds of new te technology coming out to serve that consumer. E-wallets, I don't know if you guys recently heard about Apple Pay, all these products are geared to the unbanked consumer. So if you're gonna be accepting consumer payments, it's important that you're looking to the technology to allow you to accept these forms of payment. Uh, my responsibility to my client base is to make sure that I'm on the forefront and developing that technology for that type of payment acceptance. So pay attention, guys, when you hear that this morning, Walmart has started opening checking accounts for consumers. And the leading uh, buzz line to that article was, they will open a checking account for anybody. So the world is changing. People are, uh, big businesses are now trying to get in the banking business. And if your consumers are going to be using prepaid debit cards, and five years ago, nobody thought they would take one, everybody woke up when all the state benefits started going on cards, and you had to start taking these cards for payment. So I know that you have lots of other concerns for what's going on in the future in your business. Please pay attention to what's happening to the consumer payment trends as well and get prepared for that. Yeah, and I would just say, I know this has been hit a lot at this conference, but I would say look at all your vendors, even non-technology vendors that have anything that touches a compliance button, and just you know review those and make sure that those vendors are aware of the compliance and they're actively you know keeping up with what they need to do to keep you safe. So I say just look at all your vendors that have anything to do with compliance. Just send our staff. Ross, I'm really glad you said that because one of the things that frustrates me a little bit is uh, I hear from a lot of clients, you know, vendor said this, vendor said that. You have to ask your vendor the right questions. You have to ask them probing questions. You know, if, if, if a vendor is telling you they could do something, look for the backup. You know, ask them, have you shown it to the regulator in my state? Have you got it blessed? Where's your legal opinion? Who's looked at this? You know, don't, don't just take it uh, for granted uh, that they've jumped through all the hoops and done everything right. Uh, because I, I have seen folks get in trouble, you know, thinking that the vendor is going to back them up, and and you know now especially uh, in, in light of what's going on above us, it, you really have to be in charge of your vendors because ultimately it's your responsibility, it's your liability. Um, I'm just going to take a break. Would the vendors in the back, who I know are breaking down, um, it, it's fine to break down, but if y'all could just keep the conversations down, that would be great. We're having a little trouble hearing up on, up on the stage. So what I've, I've heard the panel say is that their technology providers should be looking at automation, standardization, and then a, you, you should be looking for a t a technology and vendor providers that, uh, that are constantly innovating, that are keeping up with the, the, the changes in, in technology and creating uh, integrated systems so that you can make fewer mistakes as dealers and that you can ensure that, or that they, those technology companies can help you comply with federal and state law. So um, moving on, uh, Susan, this question's for you. How, how are dealers addressing the issue of charging convenience fees to process payments, um, particularly with respect to dealers that may not only operate in Texas or Wisconsin, or, but, but, but operate you know, in multi-states? I'm so glad you asked this question. This is a very, very hot topic because it uh, directly affects the bottom line of the, of the dealer or the finance company. Um, I want to start by trying to explain the difference between what a surcharge is and a convenience fee because there are actually two different types of fees. A surcharge is a fee that is attached to a particular type of payment method, uh, specifically a credit card or debit card. Uh, surcharges were approved by the Payment Association's MasterCard and Visa about two years ago. Certain states have restricted the ability for merchants to pass on these surcharges, even though it's approved by the Payment Association. The states themselves have said lenders, sellers, merchants, retailers cannot pass these surcharges on. Including Texas. Including Texas. Uh, convenience fees are in another type category. Convenience fees are charged for a particular type of payment channel for any type of payment in the channel, such as payment by phone or payment over a website 
or payment through text, those are considered to be what is, is referred to as a bona fide convenient payment channel where the consumer didn't have to get in their car and drive to your location and make the payment. Certain states still restrict these type of fees as well. It's very important that you understand the states that you operate in, the states that you collect money in, and what those state restrictions are. They are different in almost every single state. Um, I spoke to a dealer uh, last night that is in a restricted surcharge state, and she wanted to start charging convenience fees to her customers, but the only payment method they accept other than cash is MasterCard and Visa. So I said, you know, if I was a smart attorney, I call it a service charge because you're charging it only on a credit card. So be very careful in your implementation of these type fees. The consensus among most of these states that have these restrictions is that if a third party is charging a fee and disclosing that fee and the customer is agreeing to that fee, the dealer or finance company receives no benefit, then it, can, it, it is usually an approved process. But I would be sure that you reach out to your counsel um, and whoever else is going to be standing shoulder to shoulder with you if you get challenged and make sure that you are compliant in the way that's implemented. So um, uh, just for example, there, there are lots of ways to, to charge convenience fees for alternative payment methods. And we, we would always, as at Hudson Hook, uh, recommend that you have a free payment method. So your, your regular free payment method of walking in or mailing a check um, so that there is a, a free payment method for, for purposes of a, a cons consumer paying their transaction. But then with, with respect to convenience fees, I think you have to be careful to make sure, as Susan said, that, it's, that you're just not accepting a credit card through that particular channel. So you can have channel specific um, payment convenience fees for online or telephone, but you have to make sure that it, you're not limiting the payment method Absolutely. When, you, when you have that particular channel. And I'd just like to add that um, we have represented a client in, in connection with a, a, a Texas payment convenience fee issue and uh, received in connection with that representation of the client a letter from the Texas C Credit Commissioner saying payment convenience fees were not committed if paid or if paid directly to the creditor or indirectly to the creditor, but that payment convenience fees through third parties were not prohibited under, under Texas law. So you really want to look at how you are charging a, a payment convenience fee, what channels you're using, whether you're permitted to charge it if it's paid directly to you or not directly to you, or if it's paid entirely to a third party. And so there's a lot of questions that are involved when, before you charge a convenience fee, as is really any, any fee that is associated with the collection on the, the retail installment sale con contract, the origination or collection. When you go to charge another fee, you need to get that fee reviewed by, by your counsel, whether it's in-house or external counsel, uh, before you begin charging it. The oops does not work, and it especially does not work in Texas. You'll be refunding those fees. Um, Russ, what can a dealer do to help obtain capital or financing for its uh, credit transactions? Um, this is something I've had some experience with, um, and surprisingly, I think the two most important things to obtaining funding on lending on your portfolio um, comes down to two things, um, policies and procedures and reporting. Uh, policy and procedures are important. Um, you're most lenders, and they're all a little different in how they you know, approach this, but um, the performance of your portfolio is what they're going to base your loan advance rate on. So they want to be very comfortable that your performance of portfolio is accurate. So by having very strict policies related to underwriting, collections, and dispositions of the assets is critical to them, and that you follow those very closely. Um, some of you may have seen or been involved when a month is kind of not going well, and you have uh, repos that have officially cleared, but you decide, well, let's clear them next month. Uh, we've got enough losses this month. Um, they don't want to see that. They should follow the policy every month so they can see consistently how your portfolio is performing. 
Um, the reporting is critical. Uh, a lot of them are going to exclude certain items from the collateral base. Uh, having good reporting to make that exclusion report easy is critical every month. Um, also, they're going to come in and want to audit things every year or depending on your lender, maybe more often. Um, reporting is going to give them the tools that they can use to audit your portfolio, make sure that it is accurate and that the timing is proper. Um, that's pretty much, uh, you know, one other piece of that is the, the value of the inventory that you're booking back into your business. Uh, they're going to look at that really hard. They're going to make sure that you're valuing that inventory in line with the current guidebook. I mean, if you're <laughs> highballing the value to reduce your loss, you know, it's just going to get you somewhere else down the road. So again, following your policies consistently and strictly, I think will really help the bank be comfortable with your uh, performance of your portfolio. I think, I think one of the other important things that uh, in addition to the, to the three things that you mentioned, uh, your lenders are now going to come in and do compliance due diligences on your documents and so that you are not only going to be required to show that your, your policies and procedures you, uh, with respect to the performance of your portfolios and the value of your inventory, you're going to also have to show that you comply with, with federal and state law. Um, I was in a sales finance company uh, a couple weeks ago and they had gotten a list from their lender um, of questions with respect to their compliance management system. And so your lenders are now going to begin expecting you to have a compliance management system, so compliant documents, as well as a compliance management system. They're going to ask you about your board of directors and what the board of directors has done with respect to compliance. And so I think that's going to be a new thing that they're going to begin asking for if they haven't asked for it already. This is a, a question about uh, PCI security standards. First of all, what are they? And, and how, do you, how do you comply with them and whose responsibility is it? I guess I'll take that one. <laughs> um, PCI compliance uh, is a set of standards that was handed down by the MasterCard and Visa associations to provide a, um, a set of standards that merchants have to live by for the collection, transmittal, and storage of consumer payment data. I'm sure we all have heard the Target breach, most recently the Home Depot breach. Um, there were times that MasterCard and Visa could not hold merchants responsible for their own networks for storing this data. Those days have passed, and now anyone who is approved for a merchant account is uh, under these standards, and it is a finable offense if you are not meeting those standards. Uh, part of it has to do with the storage and, and collection of that payment data. Card numbers, CV2 numbers, expiration dates. It only surrounds credit card and debit card transactions. It absolutely has nothing to do with ACH transactions. Only the credit card numbers and the payment associate, I mean the uh, card, asso card data on that card, name, address, and phone number. I spoke to someone over the past two days that is in a, using a text program, and they have their consumers text their credit card numbers over text to them to make payment. Wow. I cannot tell you how much I winced at, the, <laughs> at hearing this information. My heart stopped just hearing yeah. it. She said, oh, it's okay. We make sure that they delete the message. And I said, well, there's probably cell phone records out there at AT&T. And what happens if somebody at AT&T happens to look at a cell phone record with your consumer's credit card information in it. You've just exposed your company. So it's very, very important that you visit these policies quarterly, that you make sure that your uh, staff members are not writing down credit card numbers, are not storing credit card numbers. If you're using the portal pay system, it is a completely PCI compliance system that relieves you from the obligations of having to worry about those issues. Each time that you move your merchant processing account, you're going to receive usually an email from a third party company you do not recognize that is asking you to follow a link to then fill out what is called a self-assessment questionnaire. If you don't do this, you're gonna see a, a, a charge on your processing statement each month for non-compliance. 
That charge could be anywhere between $25 and $49 or $50 each month. If you guys are not checking your statements for that, go home today, look at your last merchant card statement and see if you have a non-PCI compliance fee on it. If you do, it's because somebody missed filling out the self-assessment questionnaire. This has to be done annually. It's only usually done by email. So be cognizant of when you sign up for your merchant account, be cognizant of when that first email comes, fill it out, complete it, submit it, and then yearly you're gonna get another email to go through that same thing. So, so I have a question for you, Susan. We're all trained not to open emails from people we don't know because they could be viruses. Uh, what, what, are the, what does the contents of the email say? What kinds of things would we be looking for in the email so that we would recognize it as a, a PCI compliance assessment? Well, the subject line is not going to be telling enough. You'll awesome. actually have to, you know, you have to follow the link. Um, the subject line will probably just say control scan. It does, there's not a lot of information given, unfortunately. You really have to open the email up and, and it will tell you that it's in regard to your merchant account. Uh, it will not give you your most recently MID <coughs> number. Um, it, is, it is foreboding, to be honest with you. It's not real telling that that's what it's for. And to be honest with you, it's not from the company usually that you just signed up for services. It's from a completely separate company. So hopefully whoever you signed up with has educated you to watch out for this email and told you who it's coming from. Okay. So right. the, the merchants will know the... The, 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 the providers will know who they Absolutely. use and they'll be able to Absolutely. So, so well, ask, confirm it I with guess. Merchant. Absolutely. So one more thing I want to ask, yep. then I'll ask you and you can maybe direct okay. it. So it's my understanding, like for instance, uh, you get one of these things, you still need to hire a third party to do network scans on your network well, on a regular basis, Well, part of the self-assessment right? questionnaire is an is a actual scan of your internal network. So part of this self-assessment questionnaire is going to ca cause you to push a button and to scan your network. Most recently, someone that Sigma recently contracted had an open port in their network and they did not pass the scan. So, so but that doesn't end the first time. It does not end. You should be doing quarterly scans on your network to make sure that none of your ports are open so. for hacking, much like Home Depot. So there are third-party providers out there you could sign up for to do this and you probably need to get your IT staff involved because it's not something you just you would know if you're not in the technology business. That's true. So I would highly recommend you do that. Second thing I've got a question about is if you get something saying you're not compliant, a, not, a notice of non-compliance and you're actually paying extra money for it, isn't that essentially just admitting that you're not compliant from a risk perspective? That to be a lawyer perspective? Uh, I mean, it seems kind of crazy to me. I would say if you have a breach <laughs> and you have not yeah, taken I mean, the steps to make sure that you close this network, then you're gonna have a, a problem. Yeah, kind of a negligence thing. It is. So yeah, an, op an open right network, an open network is just right one that's action. open to someone reaching in and grabbing information. I believe, you're right. I mean, this, this dealer, it was a, a, a very, a, a, it was a, a website, basically, that someone had done some work in his network and he was connecting something to the website and just literally left the port open. Um, I'm not technical enough to know exactly why, but I saw the reports and he questioned me. I said, you know, you need to find someone in, whoever supports your network, run the scan, they'll be able to tell you exactly where, where the open port is. There's one more thing about that, just real quick. Um, Robbie, I don't know if he's done his session yet. I think he's doing one. No, later on. Okay, Robbie's our um, internal IT guy who, who is in charge of the 200 or plus 300, I don't know, devices we, we use to support you, servers-wise, servers and things. Um, there was some, there was some, People, I think they were in Georgia or North Carolina or whatever, maybe a couple different states, that were actually fined a tremendous amount of money by the FTC for peer-to-peer uh, -peer network file sharing issues. So, oh, I remember that, yeah. yeah. your network, I mean, you don't realize that little network, if you only have three computers or 10 or two or whatever, one, uh, needs to be, you better pay attention because there's all kinds of stuff that can, you can, software you can install that allow certain files to be shared off your network. And you, you know, just out of, you know, no, you're not trying to do anything malicious, you just don't know. Right. So you, you need to have people out there that do regular assessments because someday you might have to actually prove that you did regular assessments. So again, that's part of that whole third party provider thing and trusting people. You know, you need to, it's trust but verify. That's what I say and it's all the time, it's not once. Once a quarter, have somebody come out and just do that. It'll probably take them a few hours and they're done. One of the other things is that dealers have the obligation to safeguard their uh, customers' information. 
And uh, this, is, this is part of that too. So not only do you, should you be complying with the, P, the PCI standards that are required for taking uh, credit card payments and debit card payments, but that you should also be ensuring that your networks are secure to the extent that you have uh, consumer information on those networks, it's your responsibility and, and you should have your policies and procedures that say this is how we protect our consumers' information. That's a uniqueness, by the way. The, so with, with all of the, the com, m moving on, with all of the, the complex and uh, often confusing federal and state laws that uh, apply to motor vehicle installment sales transactions, uh, Steve, can you tell us how a dealer can make sure that they are compliant? First thing, and you've already heard this if you come to the other classes, do you have a compliance officer? And if you have a compliance officer, are you giving them the tools and the training they need to be successful? If you don't have one, I want you to go back to your dealership and I want you to appoint one. And, and then I want you to figure out how you're going to give them the training and education they need. I talk to some of your compliance officers on a regular basis. They regularly call me about things. And the number one frustration that I hear is I got the title but I have no support, I have no budget, I have no training. Might as well not have one if you're doing that. Uh, I spoke to a dealer yesterday, and he proudly said, I'm the owner and I'm the chief compliance officer. Great, fantastic. How many hours do you spend a month performing your compliance duties? Mm, well, I don't. Well, again, then you're not doing yourself any good. I, I highly doubt that, that an owner uh, that, that's worried about everything else with the business has the time to put into that job. You really need to appoint somebody that, that they could be an employee, uh, you, you know, that, that is highly specialized, that, that, that takes interest, but give them the, the kind of training that they need. The other thing, you need to make a sign and put it up in your dealership that so-and-so is the compliance officer. Let your employees know who it is. Let your customers know who it is. Now, now let's talk about the, the kind of training. There, there's formal training. Uh, National Auto Finance Association has a great uh, training module. I forget how much it costs. It's maybe like $2,000. Uh, Hudson and Cook uh, helped build the materials for it. And, and it's fantastic to really train uh, somebody in, in all the laws that apply in auto finance. AFIP. Uh, a AFIP. Uh, Dave Robertson, who spoke uh, the other day, they have a fantastic training module. I highly recommend that as well. There's other organizations that do it. So you could go that route. You know, if you're not doing that, you know, any dealer in this room, I, I think, should be uh, subscribing to their car law state module, uh, their council library state module. Uh, it, it's amazing tools. You know, I wish it was available 20 years ago when I started doing this. Uh, it, it puts you way ahead of the game. Uh, you know, other conferences do great jobs at, at, at you know, the state associations uh, have some great uh, educational materials. Go to the National Consumer Law Center website. That's like the consumer advocate think tank. They're the ones that come up with all these theories that plaintiff lawyers sue on. Go to their website and, and look at what they're hitting on, what their hot button points are, and, and find out what they're saying about auto finance. You know, similarly, you should be going to the FTC website, ftc.gov, the CFPB website, cfpb.gov every month, and you should be seeing what the announcements are in auto finance. Uh, you should be looking at the CFPB complaint database, not because you think you're going to be named in it, but because you want to see what other car <coughs> dealers are being named and, and, and what kind of complaints are out there. You want to see what's going on around you. If you do all that, you're going to be way ahead of the game. You've you got to make an investment in this stuff. And, and now I'll get off my soapbox. AutoStar is not your compliance officer, by the way. <laughs> That's another thing. It's a piece of software. You still need to do your own deal. I, I agree. And a couple things to add on to Steve, uh, Steve's statements. I agree 100% with everything, with everything Steve said. One of, the, one of the things that you can do in, in, in addition to visiting the CFPB website, you can sign up for uh, uh, 
information to get information when the CFPB publishes information. You, I became I'm friends with the FTC on Facebook and I'm fr friends with the CFPB on Facebook and I follow them on Twitter and I also signed up as a consumer to get information from the CFPB and the FTC when, when they issue it. And you can get the press releases when everybody else gets those press releases. And you don't have to, you don't have to necessarily um, understand them, but what, what, what you can do is, is look, at those, look at those press releases, see what the CFPB is doing, and, and, and learn when to call your lawyer or your vendor. You know, for example, if, if American Express got a, um, a, a, a a consent order, had a, had a consent order signed that involved ancillary products and this is what American Express's vendors did wrong, you, that may uh, incentivize you to go find out what your vendor does with respect to ancillary products and does your vendor have a compliance program. So what, what you, you get is what is the CFPB or the FTC or your state re regulator looking for and how does it affect how you operate your business. And then one of the other things that I would recommend is read the FTC and the, the CFPB's consent orders. The FTC and the, and the CFPB are regulating through consent orders. Take them as guidance as to what you should not be doing. If the CFPB fines first investors for failure to correct inaccurate reporting with respect to the, what, the, what first investors reported on the, their customers' consumer reports, that is a, a red flag for you to go make sure that you are reporting properly. So really just keep your ear to the ground. Listen, listen to your vendors, go to the vendor conferences, keep your ear to the ground, know what's going on in the industry, and then look at what's going on, on in the industry and how, how it would apply to you. Oh, excuse me. Not very good at this thing yet. At what point in time, and, and, and we're gonna switch, switch gears a little bit from compliance because we know probably right now that you have heard so much on compliance, you would like to take out your compliance shotgun. Um, so switching gears to money. At what point in time should a, should a dealer decide to grow? And, and what costs should the dealer anticipate uh, are involved in that, in, in that growth process? So growth by, by means of expanding the dealership or grow, growing, uh, yeah, I, buying another dealership, things like that. I've been in some massive growth uh, situations and uh, of course the number one issue that always is going to and I've heard it at every innovate I've ever been to was don't grow too fast uh, grow smart um, and again it all comes down to your capital how deep your pockets really are um, but some other things to think about when it comes to opening new locations um, is to make sure that you have the facility to support the location uh, that includes the ability to buy more cars to prepare more cars for sale uh, and another real big piece of it is staffing. Um, as we all know, finding good managers can be pretty tricky. Uh, a lot of companies will start a management training program when they see some growth in the future and get ahead of trying to get their staff trained and have confidence in the staff that they're gonna put in this new store. Um, and another interesting thing I've seen is we all are, you know, love tax season because we can clean out our inventory but if you don't have the capital to replace it quickly, then you start losing opportunities in the following months after tax season because your lots are sitting half empty or more. Um, that's kind of, you know, again, it really capital driven. What kind of, what kind of demographics should be, you be looking at with respect to, to, <coughs> to growth? Where are you, what are you, what are you looking I, for? I'm not the expert on that, but uh, studying the demographics and having that information is really critical to where you're going to drop that location. Um, you know, there's a lot of facilities that are empty now that are just waiting to be picked up, but you really have to look at, and there is services and, and resources to get those demographics on, on who's in a radius of the store. And uh, again, I'm not the expert on that, but that is very critical in that decision. I think maybe, uh, you, could, you should also engage your vendors to see if they can grow with you um, when you when you hire your, your vendors. Uh, 
and engage in that growth process. You want to be sure that your vendors have room for, room for that growth and are able to handle that growth and then um, also have uh, some, some maybe recovery efforts if your growth is not as smooth as possible. So, I don't know, Alan, if you can talk maybe about how, how you support the growth of a business. Mm -hmm. Well, me personally, or? What? <laughs> <laughs> you okay. as, as the, the CEO of Auto, uh, of Auto Star, <laughs> that's, that's right. Um, Okay, so it kind of goes in line with uh, uh, when people buy software or buy any technology. So I would say most people, by their very nature, are cost conscious. Would you say that? I, w I would say that, yes. Yeah. So most people, when they buy technology, they're extremely cost conscious. And again, wh what did I say earlier? I said, how much would you spend to protect this? And so understanding that's your entire livelihood, and every single day you go to work, your, your entire livelihood is on the line by your decisions that you made a week ago, two weeks ago, six months ago, five years ago. You, you kind of have to think about that. And when, I'm, when I told you to go home the very first day and make a plan, that plan has, has a, lot, a lot of things. Compliance officers, um, one of the plans is, is that if you are going to buy technology or buy software, think about the use of it and how much time you're going to spend on the implementation just to realize 100% return on that investment. People don't look at software like it's an ROI. You know, one thing about dealing with uh, entrepreneurs, um, car dealers, and you guys are all entrepreneurs at your nature, car dealerships are started by who? Who starts businesses? Is it accountants? No, not normally. It's salespeople. Salespeople start businesses, and that's good. We need those entrepreneurial and energetic people starting businesses. That's not to say some accountants don't start businesses, but <laughs> You know, we need those kinds of people. But the thing that's uh, interesting is salespeople, by their very nature, don't like paperwork. I mean, my salespeople at Autostar, they hate paperwork, and they're not very good at it, okay? But that's not their skill. That's okay. But what happens is when you've when you, you're, you got things in conflict, um, typically sales-oriented people, their idea of a return on investment is we spent X for this car, we're going to make this much money, and that's how much money I'm putting in the bank. The reality is the return on investment long term is on the, there's a lot of stuff on the back end that is the real return on investment. So often people underestimate the cost of accounting and they don't think about the cost of processes and the cost of compliance and these other costs and they don't place enough emphasis on the back ends. If you look at any really successful company, I don't care if it's a car dealership, a you know, service station or whatever, they all have one thing in common. They are very good operationally on the back end. And I, and I was telling somebody this story. Um, I could probably tell you in the installations I've done and the number of years I've done this, I'll bet you no more than 10% on the top side, 10% on the top side, did we walk in the door and they had their books balanced before we actually walked in the door. I mean, we walked into situations where they hadn't reconciled their books in two years. So their financial statements, I don't know how they reported to their lenders uh, what the information was because the numbers, they just didn't have them. And that's pretty scary, understanding that you don't really know where you are, but as entrepreneurs, we tend to run our businesses by gut feel. We know probably, right now, you're probably sitting there thinking, I've got about this much money in the bank. And you know nobody's even sent it to you, but you have a pretty good idea what it is. I know I kind of feel that way. Well, the problem with that mentality is, is that long-term, that whole lifestyle business versus long-term business infrastructure concept, doesn't, uh, they don't go well together. So when you're going to buy something, if it's technology, if it's anything, try to take advantage and use it all. And don't think, you know, like next week, because, you know, data conversions, those cost a lot of money. And, and what you've got to remember is the data conversion is not, it's not that one-time cost of whatever the conversion costs. It's the, it's the lost opportunity that happens immediately after it, because your staff is immediately less productive, okay? Your... Um, utilization and, and keeping your books going forward and all those things becomes a little more problematic. And it takes a while to get it ramped back up to where you're, you're efficient again. You're always better off buying quality first, always. In the short run, it may seem more expensive. In the long term, it's never more expensive. But as part of that, if you're going to buy it, you know, use it. Take it and embrace it and love it. The simple fact that you're here 
says that you love it. I mean, it says that you're one of those kind of people that you really want to know everything about it. Um, but you only represent, I mean, gosh, I don't know how many percentage of our clients, but you're the top of the top, okay? There's a whole lot of people who need to be here that aren't. And um, so I could applaud, I need to applaud you for that. But just, just when you take, go back to your, and take that mentality, I know I'm kind of on my soapbox here, but <laughs> take that mentality and when you go home, use it as energy to really change, change how you want to evolve things. It really all goes back to making the decision to change. But you have to decide. I mean, I can't do it for you, Steve. None of us can do it for you. It's just a decision you have to make. So, so that was a curveball question that wasn't on our list, and that was a great answer, Alan. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. And what, what, I, what I heard you say is that invest in the back-end support for your business to uh, uh, effectuate that long-term growth. You're not in this for the short term, so you need to grow your business from the bottom up. Yeah, protect your millions. That's what I would say. It's a very so, smart investment. Smart, smart investment. Moving on to, to Susan, this question is directed to Susan and Steve. Certainly any of the panelists can, can jump in. What issues do you see with dealers who are utilizing text messages to their customers and how can dealers address those issues? You uh, talked a little bit about this earlier, Susan. Yeah, you know, um, I'm a big believer in this program for, um, for your businesses because um, my background is collections, and it's always difficult and a challenge to have a, uh, a consumer answer a telephone call when they didn't want to talk to us. So consumers will absolutely answer a text, whether it's a payment reminder or a pass through alert. The acceptance policies within, this, within consumers is almost uh, 90, over 90%. Uh, the con to that is it is still a very new communication method with consumers, and so the compliance standards are changing every single day. If you're texting your consumers today, you need to be sure that you have your texting policies. If you don't even have one, then you need to go home and write one. Your texting policies on your website. And today, if you're using um, AutoStar's uh, integrated program, these terms and conditions are on the Portal Pay website, so that's taken care of for you. But if you're not using this integrated product and using a third-party product and just willy-nilly texting, be sure that you've got some kind of a text policy on how to stop those text messages published somewhere on your website. Um, also, if you're relying on your contract language to provide the authorizations for those texts, I would challenge you to understand what number you're, they're give, you're giving, uh, your customer is giving you authorization to text. Only the number on their contract? or any number that they may give you in the future. So go home and review this language on your contracts to make sure that you have the correct authorization to, to text the right number. Um, again, in the AutoStar Integrated Program, there is actually a verification text that is sent before the text program starts, a particular mobile number. That authorization must be received from the consumer, and it is logged and kept um, it, for, for future reference and they have stop policies in place. All of this is taken for you in the integrated product. But if you're not using that and using something on the outside, be sure that you have these things handled as well. I have a confession. Five, six years ago, if I was up here, I would have slammed texting. I hated it. I worked for a big finance company, and, and all I saw was the liability and the problems, and Alan's converted me. <laughs> That's a going over for a technology company does for you. Uh, I, I love texting now, I think it's great. I think you need to make sure you're doing it right though. Uh, I think you need to make sure, starting in your credit application, you have the magic language that, that gives you permission to text. Uh, you're getting the, the cell phone information. You have the language in your retail installment contracts. And maybe you have it some other places too. Uh, and maybe you put the policies on the website. You need to have policies for your employees that they're not just gonna willy nilly you know, you wouldn't let them write collection letters, hope, at least hopefully not. Uh, you're not, you're not going to let them just grab the phone and start texting. You need to make sure that you have clear policies about what's allowed, what's not allowed, you know, down to, if you're using a vendor, the vendors do it for you, they pretty much, you know, the, these are the 10 messages that are approved, here's when you use them. Uh, if you're not doing it that sophisticated, you, you need to do that for yourself. You need to clearly uh, document it. 
and, and, and make sure that your people, you know, and train, them. don't just train them once the day they start working for you. Train them repeatedly because there is liability if you do this wrong. Uh, but otherwise, I love texting because it takes a lot of the adversarial and, and acrimony out of the relationship. Uh, I have found that customers don't want to talk to the collectors. They're embarrassed, they're having a difficult situation, whatever. They would much prefer to interact uh, on a text basis. So take advantage of the technology, embrace it, and you'll be a convert just like me. And I, th I think, uh, Steve, we're, we're need to also express the point that there is an entire generation who is losing the ability to communicate uh, via verbal communications. And so they are, they only have their cell phones and they spend a lot of time on them and they have them wherever they go and they are only comfortable texting. And it may not be that, the, that it's the, because it's a collection or anything else, it just may be that's the way of life for the generations that are coming up uh, who really didn't know what a, a rotary dial phone was. Um, I think an, another, important, uh, another important issue to remember is that the authorizations that I think Susan is referring to in AutoStar, uh, the, the payment portal and the contracts, they don't give you the authorization to telemarket. Uh, so you may not solicit sales from, uh, based upon those authorizations. What those authorizations give you are, uh, is the ability to service and collect rather than telemarket. So if you are using uh, telephone communications, text messages, facsimiles, emails to sell, things, then you really need to stop and make sure that what you're doing complies with uh, the telemarketing sales rule and the uh, can spam act, so, which is a, a whole topic for another discussion. Maybe next year's Innovate, we can talk about telemarketing and telephone consumer protection. Russ, on to you. What are some effective methods to keep administrative personnel engaged in their jobs? Um, on that area, I, I have found personally that, uh, of course, uh, any department head is only as good as the people in his department, and keeping your employees engaged is critical to get them to take pride and care in their work. Uh, my approach, and it's worked so far, is to let the employees know what that piece of the process they're doing every day relates to the business in whole. Um, you know, it's really easy to get in a box in a tunnel and you're not really seeing the effect of your work, but if you uh, take those employees and say, you know, look how important purchasing these cars is, and without you and doing this particular function, we wouldn't have anything to sell, and kind of walk them through the whole process and make them aware of, you know, the functionality of their position as it relates to the whole company. Um, and then, of course, you have to come up with some way to, uh, to measure, set goals, and reward people who meet or exceed those goals. And again, that's a pretty common theory, but uh, I really think letting them know what they do as it relates to the company is the biggest factor that I've found. Do you have um, any ideas that you've seen in the past that have been successful rewards for employees? Like well, it depends on what they're doing. Uh, you know, what their position entails. I mean, collectors have their own ways to monitor their performance. Um, it gets a little bit trickier, say, in the accounting department. Uh, sometimes you have to get pretty creative, and, you know, it's not always up to their control on the volume that they have access to. It, it really depends on the business volume, et cetera. But, um, you know, you kind of have to sometimes think outside the box to come up with those, you know, measurements, and uh, it's not always easy. So, so what I've heard you, what I heard you say were really, really kind of two things. Value your employees and they'll, they'll value their jobs. Exactly. And uh, think out of the box to incentivize them to, to, do their, to do their jobs well. And I think uh, training and then retaining employees is an incredibly difficult task because it doesn't, it, training doesn't happen overnight, it's an investment. And so you really want to keep those em employees. And so there's a lot to be said to making the environment 
employee friendly. Yeah, and some job satisfaction too, you know, yeah. where you really enjoy and you feel like you got a lot done that day and you know, you go home feeling good about, you know, what you accomplished. Right. You feel like you've had a successful day and I think and you know, all of us want to feel like we've had a successful day. And so as managers and operators of of dealerships and sales finance companies, um, that's part of the job in addition to selling cars and compliance and improving vendors and all the other things that you have to do. So add employee satisfaction to, to that list. There are, the list, the list goes on and on of, of what dealers are faced with, the challenges that they're faced with every day. And those daily problems can become very, very daunting. Uh, there, there are some big mistakes that, that, that dealers can make. Alan, what do you think the biggest mistake is with respect to, that dealers make with respect to acquiring technology? And you know, that might, might have been answered by your curveball question that. Yeah. Um, not using it? Yeah, I think I've already answered that. Okay, so. I so, mean, essentially, so. but I mean, just to summarize, <clears throat> think about what you need next year. I know that's so hard. See, see, here's the deal. When people buy software, it's like anything, it's like, it's kind of a, you know, black box. You don't know exactly what you're buying until you've bought it. So you could be on this product for, you know, you'd be on it for six months and you're just understanding what you bought. So when you look at it, you know, you look through this window and it's nice and pretty and shiny, you know, and it looks real nice. But then when you actually start driving it or start using it, that's when you, that's when you really understand what you bought. I like to tell people this, here's a good analogy. So if you were to imagine two swimming pools, these swimming pools are 50 yards away from you and you're looking down there and they're so pretty, they've got the same coping, the same deck work, same landscaping, they're just both beautiful, okay? So now, if I was to put a blindfold on Nikki and a blindfold on me, and I was to walk, we were going to walk 50 yards to those swimming pools, and as we get closer and closer and closer, we start putting our blindfolds on, and we eventually get to those, and we both climb a 10-meter diving board, and we go to the end, and we jump off. One is four feet deep, one's 10. The problem is, it's difficult in software to identify the 10-foot one, you know, and that's the one you want to jump in. On the surface, they look identical, but the four-foot one's going to kill you. Okay, I, I, and so, I hope I'm not in the four-foot pool. No, I would take it for you. <laughs> promise you. <laughs> so you know that's kind of how I how I view software, and, and there's a lot of things like that that you don't because your business is not a, is not technology. You just kind of know what you want. You trust, and you you do these things, and that's that's obviously good, but. You know, anything you buy, you just need to make sure you choose a reputable provider and that you've done some research and that they have some sophistication. You know, one of the things I asked, uh, and, and I think we should take some questions from the audience, sure. actually, but one of the things I, I asked at a NIADA conference, we did this exact panel at NIADA in June, was I asked a question, it was a pretty large room, and I said, how many of you have actually visited the facilities of your software provider? Okay, do you know I got like two hands in the whole room? And, and they were honest, our clients. <laughs> we paid them to come. No. Yeah, they, uh, yeah, so only, only a couple of them. So it, it was interesting because, you know, it, it's like you, you really don't understand, okay, is the, do these people work out of a garage? You know, what, are their, what, are their, what does their facilities look like? What kind of, how do their departments organize? Do they look like they're in cooperation with each other? Do they seem all to be um, working in concert together on a unified front? We all take our, we all use the trust factor. Gosh, you know, he's doing it for this person. It's got to be good for that person. Visit your provider's facilities. It doesn't have to be software. We're, you're welcome to come to our office anytime. And uh, so, you know, we would love that. And uh, I, I would just recommend that for anybody you do business with. I mean, you might walk in the door and see it's in complete disarray and papers are sitting on everybody's desk and maybe it's even your information and it's exposed. So, so just kind of, you know, just do due diligence like you would anything else you'd buy. That's, that's probably my biggest. Um, so strategic plan, you need to strategically plan and, 
and in, invest in a software that's going to help you build your future, mm -hmm. uh, you also need to do your due diligence on, on those companies that you are involved with. And I yeah, think, and you know, these people, the, everybody here in the audience has gotten halfway to your office by just being here. Yeah, absolutely. So AutoStark does kind of bring your office to this, this presentation, and this presentation does help train you on how to more fully utilize AutoStar. Does, does AutoStar provide any uh, outside of this training, or what, what, are, oh, what, yeah. are, what are available to... Well, we have lots of available options. You know what's funny you said, because I forgot to make this announcement. I was supposed to make it the very first day. One of the things I told my team in our town hall, we had a town hall about a month ago. We, we do town hall meetings twice a year, at least. And we go off site and we have a you know hotel and we feed and have drinks and have fun and team team building kind of stuff. And uh, in that town hall, I basically had two complaints that I that I wanted to address. And really, they directly affect you. So I just should just tell you what they are. Uh, number one was I felt like we had gotten to the point that you know all the rules sometimes get in the way of common decisions, common smart decisions in business. So. You grow to a point, you have to construct rules. All of you that are growing, Russ was in a really fast growing company and there's a number of you out here that are growing really fast. You have to have rules. It's just, it's just is how it is. Otherwise things aren't standardized and all those. However, sometimes rules get in the way of good common sense. And so what I told my staff was this, listen, if, if you called a vendor up and you were told you had to pay for this, would you be upset? And I said, so look at it this way. If it's for the benefit of everyone, all of you, then we should just do it, you know? So a good example would be reports. If it's to the benefit of everybody, we should just write the report. And we may not turn it around as fast as you want, but we should just build it. You know, quit making excuses and saying, oh, that's $1,000, that's $200. It's stupid. So that was one of the conversations I had. The second one I, that I announced there was that you know, it's in, our, it's in our and your best interest if we train you. So again, come to our facilities. One of the things that we've uh, that we put in place is we're going to put together a regular schedule. We have not done this yet, and it's not been announced yet. We're going to put together a regular training schedule because we're going to have to actually dedicate people to doing this, and um, we're not going to charge you for it. So you just send people to AutoStar, and we're going to have regular courses because we want you to be more educated. The more educated you are, the better you are, and the better you'll be for us, and the better you'll be when you go back and, and all those things. So we, we want that. We want you to do that. That's the reason we started this seven years ago. The reason, you know, seven years ago, we were, you know, I was like trying to find a way to effectively communicate with all of our customers. I couldn't find a common way to do it. When we communicate with you now, we send you emails. We send you, we have updates on various social media. We do all these things, but you know what we can't do? We can't get you to read them. And we do everything we can, uh, you know, we'll, we'll go see somebody. I mean, the most recent thing is, how many of you have seen the Customer 360? You probably, you might've seen it here, okay? Customer 360, uh, one, of our, one of our sales guys has out, been out in the field seeing dealers recently. And he said, how many of you seen the Customer 360? Well, what's that? Well, let me show you. Click, click, click. Take them through the software and show it to them. And they go, yeah, you know what? I can see how you missed it. It's only been there 11 months, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's kind of those things. And we've sent notices out on these things, but we need you to read the communications we send you. It's so often we hear what we, well, we just delete your emails. I mean, I've actually, they've told us that. So I was telling somebody recently, I said, you know what we need to start doing? We need to start texting them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> and we need to start texting them, at least the urgent stuff, you know, not the, not the mundane stuff, but the urgent things like update urgent notices, things like that. So, you know, that's our initiatives for, for this next year. And I, and I wish I'd have said that to everybody, but didn't get an opportunity to do that because I flat forgot. But, Happens. you know, I, and, and my, my employee base, they, you know, they applauded these things when we talked about it because I don't think they feel comfortable saying to you, we're going to charge you for this or charge you for that. I mean, honestly, if you, if you can't get behind something and you don't feel good about it, how can you sell it? You know, it's just, it's just is how it is. Now, sometimes you have to charge for things. It's just the very nature because, you know, I don't know if you know, but the people we pay are not cheap. So, and we're in a pretty competitive market. So we want to make sure we have good people. And uh, the only way sometimes to do that is generate revenue. But again, we have a long-term vision for that. We want you to keep, stay as a customer. We don't have that Krispy Kreme vision. So anyway, that's enough.
Thank you. We have a, a couple more questions, and then we'll, we'll open up. We have till 1030. Yeah, and we can also take some questions from them. Okay, do, let me ask, let me ask Steve this one question, then we, maybe we can open it up for, for questions. Steve, what are some repetitive risks that dealers um, keep making, and, and how do you, do you handle them? Yeah, the big one I've been talking about the last couple of days is be very aware of your credit reporting. Uh, you do it every month. It's a big responsibility. The regulators are after it, so, so make sure you understand what you're reporting. It's your responsibility to make sure you're reporting right. Uh, the other one is adverse action. You know, it, it stinks when you get sued for somebody you never even had a chance to make money on. You know, you turn them on, you turn them down, they leave your lot, and next thing you know, you're, you're, you're in a just a you know, horrible situation. So make sure you understand how adverse action works and what your rights are. I'm not gonna get on the soapbox about it, it's just something you really have to be aware. And then the final thing is, uh, these, these are picking up across the country, uh, repossessions, you know, there's a lot of responsibilities under Article 9 that you're under. Uh, you know, make sure that your letters and, and everything you're doing have been checked out at least every year or two. Uh, I talked to some dealers that they're using the same paperwork they've been, you know, last 10 years, laws change. Make sure that you get a, a clean bill of health and you're using the right stuff. If you do all that, you're gonna take a lot of your repetitive risk out of your business. And I, I think one, one thing I would add, Steve, is uh, monitor your complaints and the resolution of the complaints. If you have a regulator come in and you have noted a complaint with no resolution, they are not going to look too kindly on that. But if you have noted a complaint with a resolution that is favorable to, the, to your customer, that is going to uh, bring, bring you lots of, of kudos from the regulator and also make them a lot happier to be in, in, in your business. So we want to open it up for questions. Uh, do you have any questions for the panelists? Surely somebody has one. Pardon? Surely somebody has one. Surely someone has one. Crickets. Okay, then I have, um, I have a couple of questions. Okay. For curveball. For them? For, <laughs> no, for you. <laughs> um, with respect to the, the how, how, how can I, uh, uh, let, me, let me rephrase that. What, is, what do you think new in, in each of your industries, in each of the, your areas of, of focus, what is new that's coming down the pike that, these, that, that are, your customers should be aware of? I'm Wes. thinking. I'm not sure. I don't think Russ has. <laughs> Russ, you don't have a role in this, do you? Accounting. Um, you don't have a role in this, really. Excuse me. From from an accounting perspective, yeah, there, okay, that's is, is there any is there anything new that 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 the dealer should be aware of? Um, is, I'm pretty much drawing a blank here. Pardon? I'm drawing a blank. Drawing a blank. Okay. Well, we can come back to you. Um, I wouldn't. Lease lease accounting. Lease accounting. Well, that's a good point. Why don't you talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> Want to come on up? <laughs> so the, the, the issue was lease accounting. And um, I am not an accountant, so I would not, uh, not be able to explain it. But there are, there are when, I, when you enter into a, a new arena, making sure that you have your, your tax advisors and, and accountants involved is, is pretty important. I'll take a small piece of it. You can but I don't want to be wrong, so you can correct me, okay? No I'm okay with that. Um, so, because we do lease accounting, we have two types of lease accounting in the software. We have operating lease and, and uh, capital lease accounting. Uh, most buy here payer transactions really don't qualify for operating lease treatment. Uh, essentially, uh, that's an accrued receivable that comes on the books as the payments accrue with an income that's being earned uh, at that time when the money's paid, it reduces the receivable and increases cash. So your financial statements look kind of awkward because the only receivables you have on the books are really short-term receivables. But you can get away with operating leases in this space if you truly have a exit clause that allows you to terminate the lease uh, really at any time with a reasonable departure fee, so to speak. Um, we have customers that are doing this, like uh, Drive Time is doing it. 
we have several customers who are doing these types of trends and several other customers that are researching them uh, to come up with better ways to retain customers and make their, um, their business more customer friendly, I guess you could say. Um, from the capital lease perspective, uh, most of the lenders, uh, from a gap perspective, would want you, you probably would want to do that. Essentially, that treatment just says it looks just like your regular retail installment sales contract looks on your books. It's just uh, you have an interest, uh, interest which is rent charge. Uh, you have depreciation, but you basically have the equivalent of, of that type of, of transaction on your books. So some people have said, okay, if, if I could only do capital leases because I don't pass this test, and there's a test online that you can go read about, it's like a five-point test, and it says something about 90% of the value. You know, it has all these different um, items, and most buy-here-payer transactions basically mix, m m miss the test immediately. But if you go read on that, you'll find out that if you're doing a capital lease accounting system, it's really not any different than what you're doing with your retail installment sales contract. So some of the motivations for doing it. Uh, you have to have ver various motivations. Your motivations don't need to be driven by what your tax uh, payments are going to be. They have to be for competitive reasons or, or whatnot. We also had customers who have wanted to do balloon transactions, which are um, kind of a retail installment sales contract with a future value that's been predetermined at the end. Various states have different rules on that, which Nikki could definitely comment about. Um, but some of those, like, like uh, walkaway balloons, you ever heard of that? GM had a program a long time ago. Uh, it was a walkaway balloon. You basically, car was titled in your name. You literally could turn the vehicle back in at the end, and you were not responsible for the balloon. That way, they could register the vehicle in your name, and you felt like you owned it. Um, so, even though we do support balloon payments, we technically do not support walkaway balloon transactions. So, and some states prohibit those. So you just need to or require them. Yeah, or require them. That's true. So all these things, uh, you know, you need to consider if you're going to put a program in place like that. I'll tell you something I'm really excited about, and, and that's Secure Close. And, and I'm not, not trying to push it. I'm just telling you, as somebody that spent the first half of his career uh, fighting it out in court all the time on behalf of buy here, pay here dealers, uh, I can't tell you how many times, you know, you wind up with he said, she said in front of a judge or a jury. And I love Secure Close because it standardizes uh, a part of the, the process that gets attacked a lot by lawyers. And, and I, I had the opportunity recently, uh, I, was, I was in a room with a lot of consumer lawyers uh, through something with the state bar. And I was talking about Secure Close and they were just kind of shaking their head. They, they didn't like it very much uh, because, because it really takes a lot of the wind out of their sails if uh, the dealer is going to be able to show you know, what happened and it's going to be consistent, and it's going to be the same way every time, that there's not a lot of uh, wiggle room based on how the closer is feeling, whether he's rushing, who the customer is. It cuts off a lot of those arguments. I mean, it's, it's funny. We, we were meeting with a, a client about it, and, and one of the salesmen was like, gee, this is too compliant. I'm like, man, can we get a testimonial out of that? <laughs> Yeah, so I'm just really excited about, about the, the ability to bring that technology to the dealerships on the front line in an area that dealers get attacked on. Um, I would say in the next five to 10 years, we are probably going to see anywhere between three to seven new types of consumer payment methods uh, hit the market. Anything from point sharing among merchants to e-wallets, and it's really going to be up to uh, the payment processing community to get ready for these type of things and uh, the merchant uh, community to get ready to invest in technology to be able to accept these type of consumer payments. They are really on the forefront. Pay Near Me was probably the first one that really took the leap out. Uh, this group of guys had had a lot of experience in the payment business and found that there was a niche for cash. Very smart move. Uh, I think there are going to be a lot more types of methods like that coming, where people can go pay at a 7-Eleven, pay at Walmart. Walmart surely is trying to get in the payment space as after their announcement today. So we're going to see many of these, I think, big box retailers trying to get in the payment space, and it's going to be very friendly to the consumer base. They're after that unbanked consumer. So uh, for you guys, it's going to mean your customer wants to walk into Walmart and make a payment. How are you going to allow that to happen? So I think that's what's new for us. I think that's great. 
Are there any, any other questions? If not, I can wrap this up. So, I, I want to oh. give a... I want to give a plug real quick. I hope that y'all will stay for uh, Mike Dunnigan, who's speaking next. If you've never heard him speak, he does a great job, and I think it's really important information, so I hope y'all stay for We're him. not really going to take a break. We're just going to go straight to him if we can, okay. as quickly as possible. There's a question back in the back. Uh, very Here. important as a, a small dealer, and we come to shows like this, and um, you know we get some information, some basic where to go, from there on the compliance front, we go back to our dealerships and um, if we get engaging the, the attorney generals and uh, different state regulators on trying to stay on top of the compliance issues, aren't we in turn putting ourselves on their radar? Making it known who we are and what we do, then they're just going to focus on, all right, here's a target. Did, did you speak to that yesterday? I'm, I'm trying to think whether you or Eric spoke to that yesterday. Uh, I think Eric may have. Yeah. There, there are ways that you could get all the information without waving a red flag saying, here I am. I mean, I, I think you need to go to the sites. I think you need to ask questions. You need to look at what kind of write-ups they're doing, what, what kind of things that they are policing. Uh, I don't think you have to stand out in front and, and you know, wave the flag. Uh, but, but certainly, uh, you need to make sure that you're doing these things and, and know what's going on around you. You, know, you, know, you all operate in, in vastly different markets. You know, and, and I always advise two things. Know what your particular regulator is doing and don't use the guy that set up your corporation uh, to handle your compliance. You know, get with, with a, an expert in consumer finance compliance. And I think in addition to that, you know, there was a, a, an AutoStar customer who was using a, another company's program and was cited by the Texas Credit Commissioner for the failure to, to the, for violations of the law using, using this other program. And when they came on to AutoStar, they were able to fix it. They worked with the Texas Credit Commissioner to comply with the law. And uh, then the Texas Credit Commissioner put that dealer on a board that advises the Texas Credit Commissioner about dealer issues. So you can establish relationships and effectuate change as well. And so I think you want to, the, the, the better your relationship with your regulator, uh, I, I think the, the better you'll do in the event that you do something wrong because they know that you're focused on compliance. So I, I would say hiding uh, is, 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 might be even a little scarier than reaching your hand out and shaking it. Um, I, I think that's important. So, so we've talked today about compliance, communication, controlling your decisions, automation, standardization, reporting, data security, training and education, employee satisfaction, and strategic planning. That is a whole lot in an hour and a half. <laughs> uh, I'm going to close, close the, the, this, this program with another quote from Proverbs 12, verse 11. He who tills his land will have plenty of bread, but he who pursues worthless things lacks sense. What I, what, what I think all of us on this panel would advise is take what you've learned today and over the past few days, prioritize them uh, with respect to the risks of your particular business, and go home and begin tilling. I'd like to thank our panelists and thank you all for being here and listening so attentively. Thank you. Follow you into the jungle.